Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, bend it like Burke. New Mexico United CEO takes us behind the scenes as city councilors approved a lease for a new soccer stadium, years after voters declined the initial idea. Plus, what happens when you add more time and don't change the functioning reality of what's happening in schools is you, you really just do get more of the same. Teachers, lawmakers, and others are pushing back against a proposed change that would add more school days around the state. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DeVizio. The state's public education department wants to change school calendars. If adopted, the measure would increase the number of instructional days required for students statewide. Over the next hour, I'll speak with several people with different perspectives on the proposal. You'll hear from a teachers union president who says continually adding more time in the classroom just means stretching already stressed teachers even thinner, and a state legislator concerned about the timing of PED's plan, less than a year after lawmakers passed a similar extension. PED declined to make someone available for tonight's show, so you will not be hearing the department's perspective on this proposal. In the second half of the show, Our Land's Laura Paskus speaks with New Mexico Poet Laureate Lauren Camp. For Camp, poetry is a way to build empathy. She talks with Laura about her new book and a project that brings what she calls epic poetry to communities across the state. But first, we head to Albuquerque's Balloon Fiesta Park, where the city's USL Soccer Club has the green light to build a new stadium. Peter Trevisani, CEO and President of New Mexico United, stopped by our studio for a one-on-one -on -one interview. In partnership with Alternative News Weekly, The Paper, editor Andy Lyman chats with Trevisani about plans for the new field. He also asks about the City Council's decision this month to approve a lease for the stadium, which comes after voters denied the initial idea in 2021. Peter Trevisani, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me about this stadium today. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me in, Andy. Uh, as, in terms of full disclosure, I should probably mention uh, I've got a 10-year-old super fan of all things soccer at home. So I, I am a season ticket holder this past season, season ticket holder coming going forward. Uh, we went to almost every home game last season and hope to do the same. So just to sort of get that out there before we get too in far into the conversation. I'm a season ticket holder as well, <laughs> so uh, we, we share that in common. Yeah, good, good. Well, I hope they don't charge you. Uh, I, I do pay for my season tickets, but that's a whole okay. different story. Uh, well, we can get right into it here. Uh, New Mexico United had uh, a win off the field, so to speak, when the Albuquerque City Council approved a lease agreement between your, your organization, New Mexico United, and the city of Albuquerque to use some space at the Balloon Fiesta Park for this new stadium. Can you walk us through sort of what the fan experience is going to be at this new stadium compared to where you play now at the Isotopes Park? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, we were really excited that that city council uh, approved it, uh, the lease of seven acres of land to the to the to the team so we could build a privately funded stadium uh, and at a seven to two vote. And then uh, also um, EPC voting to eight to one to uh, adapt the master plan. So I think that was really validating just them saying, hey, this is a, this is we're in a growing city and these are the kind of uh, projects and assets, community assets we need to be the next best version of ourselves. In terms of the experience within the new facility, uh, we're starting to just get to the fun part uh, after years of getting, getting here. And uh, it's gonna be different from isotopes. Uh, I don't know exactly what it's gonna look like uh, because it's all not set in stone, but what's really important is it has to feel authentic for New Mexicans. And so we wanna make sure it's a place that when you go there, you're like, hey, I feel like I'm in a New Mexico stadium. I feel like uh, how do we how do we integrate things like the sun and how do we integrate the wind and, and our natural uh, beauty of the mountains into, into the facility? And then I also think something that we're really going to focus on is how do we promote our best assets? And for example, why can't 100 percent of the food in the facility be from New Mexico, or if it's someone's making grapefruit, at least it's coming through some kind of New Mexican vendors. Why do we have to bring in frozen cheeseburgers from, from Cincinnati? So, you know, I, I really feel like if we can start to show off our greatest assets and we're, we have some of the best farms and ranches in the, in the world, then that's, that's part of our mission and that's how we, we make the next best version of ourselves. And when should uh, fans expect to be able to, you know, step into the, through these gates to see a game for the first time? Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, rather than focusing on groundbreaking, what we're focusing is uh, staying in dialogue with with all the constituents. So clearly, you know, the city, but also 
Balloon Fiesta and the neighbors and making sure that when we, what we put together is something that is respectful of our surroundings and puts us all in the best light because it really is, while privately funded, a community asset. Um, we're targeting 2026. I think that is a, uh, a date worth going for and shooting for, but we need to make sure we do it right and we, take, and we don't take any shortcuts. And I think your current lease at Isotopes is up 2027, is that correct? We were able to extend with the Isotopes uh, to 2027, uh, which, was, uh, which was great um, because we do need a place to play. So it gives us a little bit of a buffer, not a lot. Uh, so we're really at the point where we have to move forward. It, it, it's a multi-year process from here, no matter what. And so whether it's 2026, 2027, but we have to move forward from here. Otherwise, we're going to push outside of that envelope. I'd like to get into the, uh, some specifics of the lease. I mean, we don't have time to go line by line through the lease agreement, but um, technically there's some public money involved, um, but obviously there's money coming from your organization. Can you walk us through sort of who's paying for what and how that breaks down? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll do the best I can on sure. that. Um, and I'd, I'd explain it like this, is that uh, we have for the last few years been focused on building a privately funded stadium. Um, and in order to do that, it was pretty clear to us we were going to need some kind of collaboration uh, with the public um, and uh, just to be able to build a facility. And so we looked at a lot of sites. Um, and when we came to Balloon Fiesta, what really um, was exciting about that location for us is that one, there's 13,000 parking spots there already. And they are used for two weeks out of the year for the, one of the greatest festivals in the world, the greatest balloon festival, one of the greatest festivals in the, in the world. And for those two, you know, couple weeks, we won't be active or activated. So that's great. The ingress and egress can handle 100,000 people. We're closer to 10. So we had this site that was really, you know, used to that. And so at that point, then it, then it becomes, well, how do you build something privately on public land and you know, we have anti-donation clauses. And so where we came out is, yes, we'll lease uh, seven acres, which will be the footprint of the stadium uh, and, um, and build privately. So 100% of the, the stadium on that seven acres will be private. But there's a lot of infrastructure needs that need to go into place, many of which need to go in place in any ways for this 400 acre park. And so things like, you know, it, you know maybe that means improving power or water. There has to be work to be done to figure out exactly what those things are. But thankfully, the state legislature has already appropriated about $13,000 uh, of public money, as well as I think another $5 million uh, for, balloon, for Balloon Fiesta. So I think there's about $18 million of public money that can only go into the infrastructure, building bathrooms, making sure vendor row is better, lighting, maybe repaving, re, uh, you know, which is a common you know, expense for a public park. So. So that's where it sits right now. We're uh, obligated in the lease to put in at least 30 million of private money and we're prepared to do that. Uh, and I think between that and the, pro uh, the state money that's been allocated, uh, we're gonna have a facility that we're all really proud of. And that's so that's 13 million from uh, capital outlay money that local legislators sort of earmarked for that, right? And, that's right. Uh, and that money, um, some of that money was spent, for example, when the city did a feasibility study a couple of years ago, they used some of that money um, to do some preliminary work. So it's already been put in place, but that was earmarked to, to build this uh, facility and 100% uh, is coming from Capital Outlay. Gotcha. Um, we can go back in time a little bit here. In 2021, 65% uh, of the voters essentially said, no way, we don't wanna fund a stadium with uh, general obligation bonds. Um, can you walk us through sort of how we got to where we are today and what some of those conversations were, who you had to talk to, how you came to that decision as, uh, I know you're not the only owner, but how the team came together and, and made that decision like, hey, let's, let's throw some money in for this. Yeah, I think, I think to really do that, we have to like take maybe one or two more steps backward and kind of go to the whole origin of the team. And we, when the ownership group came together for New Mexico United, as you mentioned, uh, I'm one of the owners, I'm the majority owner, but we have other owners and we're all either from New Mexico or have raised our families in New Mexico. And so what we wanted to do is, yes, we wanted to bring a soccer team, but more importantly, we wanted to figure out how can we bring our community together, especially at a time where it felt very divided. How can we bring a community together so that we can sit, show everybody that when we all rally together, we're the, the strongest, best version of ourselves. And soccer uh, being a sport that's played all over the world, um, it's probably the only sport that's played in every single country around the world. 
uh, is, is the perfect vehicle to, to include all. Um, and so when we brought the team in, we knew we didn't have a place, a, a soccer venue. That was really clear. We looked around, there was nothing. So the idea was, well, could we convert Isotopes Park, uh, which is a city owned park that the Isotopes lease and have been leasing for 20 years and doing an amazing job with. Could we convert that into a soccer field and there and that has happened in some other cities and so we are able to do that so we convert the current field from a baseball stadium into a soccer stadium so we have to get around the mound fill in the infield there's a lot of work a lot of money and that that's all great we knew we needed to do that what we were hoping to accomplish at that point is is this a team that the state's interested in that the city's interested in are people going to show up and if they do then we'll have a better idea of what kind of facility we need are we getting three or four thousand people or 13 or 14,000 people. And luckily it was the latter. We you know, had over 10,000 people a game the first season, the first couple, and then we had COVID. But so we clearly had this team that was, was activated. So then it became a matter of what is next. And I think the city um, felt that, hey, 20 years earlier, we used a similar mechanism to build a stadium for isotopes that would, but was paid for using um, you know, city tax dollars, uh, but then would be leased out uh, to, to a team. And so we, we, we got behind that idea and, um, and you're right, uh, people voted and it was heard 65% of people said, no, we do not wanna use city dollars to build a, a public stadium. Um, we wanna use city dollars for other things. And so at that point, we just took a step back. I actually say, uh, and it, it's 100% true, is that the best night of sleep I got in that year was the night of the election because I said, okay, that's behind us. We know it's a no. Now let's go figure out how to turn, make, make a yes. And so that, that's the process. And from there, we, we just focused on funding it privately and that's what we're gonna do. Um, the voters obviously didn't get a say this time around. It's a little bit of a different situation, obviously. Um, what do you say to the characterization that this is sort of an end around, that voters uh, didn't get a say this time around, that it was just left to the city council? I need to really understand that, that line of thinking a little stronger. You know, it is a privately funded stadium. I don't know that we vote on privately funded projects, you know, apartment buildings, uh, housing, uh, warehouses. So I'm not so sure why people would want to vote on a privately funded facility. Um, and so I, you know, that doesn't, so I'd have to really kind of understand that line of thinking. Sure. Um, there's no end around because the city isn't spending a dime. Uh, we have, we, all we did was we, we had a problem and we solved for it. We listened, we adapted and we so, we solved for it. And, and we still have so much work to do. It's not done. Um, there's a lot of work that has to, to still happen. But in terms of that particular issue on people saying, well, I didn't, I didn't want a stadium. By the way, I, didn't, I never took the 65% to say I didn't want a stadium. I took it and we took it, uh, and I think rightly so, that it said that we don't want to use city tax dollars to build a publicly owned stadium. Uh, a lot of people that voted no loved the team and we're really excited for the team to have a stadium, but they just didn't want the city to, to pay it. And this proposal uh, does just that. Sure. One of the things that was sort of hanging over this was the United Soccer League, which is where United, New Mexico United is part of that league. Mm -hmm. um, they said pretty publicly that they had no interest in holding franchise rights for, for teams that didn't have a home, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't remember hearing this come out in council meetings or even from the organization saying, if we don't do this, uh, we ought to do this or else, dot, dot, dot. Um, of course, USL did say that. How did that sort of, the looming consequence, shape conversations you had with some of these elected officials? Uh, you know, was that a sense of urgency when you went to the mayor's office or council to say, hey, we gotta do this? You know, personally, I'm not someone who wants to use an or else line of thinking to get something done. I don't like, I, I don't think that that's really constructive and productive. I think too many times here, we, we're, we get to a place of yes because of a threat. And at New Mexico United, I, I think we really feel strongly that we wanna focus on the positivity of the project and we wanna focus on the reasons to say yes 
and we're not here to say if you don't do this, we're gonna we're gonna take our toys and leave the sandbox. Um, I think that that doesn't serve us very well. And what we really wanted to do is say, you know what, New Mexicans can build really nice things for New Mexicans. We have all the resources we need right here in our state. We don't need handouts from outside of the state. We don't need other people to come in. Uh, we can do it with people who are born and raised here, have decided to live here, and really care deeply about our community. So you're never gonna hear us threaten to leave. Um, this is New Mexico's team. That's why we built it. It's gonna be here for 100 years. And whatever the hurdles are, we'll just figure out how to climb and get over the hurdles. Um, what we're not gonna do is, is threaten to take the hurdles away. So uh, that's great to go into this next question of ownership. You go to the uh, a home game in the rowdy section, so to speak. Uh, there's this real sense of ownership and pride that comes with it. Um, I also think uh, another hallmark of New Mexico is sort of sometimes people call it cynicism, critical uh, thinking of, of or being critical, saying this isn't going to work out. Um, for folks that are looking at this and saying this guy, Peter Trevisani, just uh, made this deal to build a stadium. His team's gonna be worth a whole lot more money. Um, how, how long are you, what's your future look like with this team and how long are you gonna stay at this whole uh, ownership deal? Yeah, uh, our vision is, is a 100 year vision. We talk about this all the time at United. And in, in, that, in that mission, in the fulfillment of that mission, players are gonna come and go. Coaches are gonna come and go. Owners, including Peter Trevisani, are going to come and go. Fans that are going to go to every game for 50 years will also have a time when they're no longer at the games. That's the beauty of it. Um, and so, you know, we always have to understand that what we're, we're putting in place, we just want to leave and make it better for the, for the next you know, generation and, and the next person. So, you know, our, our ownership group is obviously very committed. We've put a lot of money into the team. We're going to put more money in for the stadium. This is not, I come from finance. This is not uh, uh, an ROI, a return on investment uh, project. This is a, an ROC, a return on community investment. This, the dividend that we get from New Mexico United is the joy, are the smiles in the, in the stands. The, the joy of people that, that when we hear stories of, I was going through the most difficult time in my life and I was at my lowest point. And I got through it because of my New Mexico United family, because of the people that I go to the games with. We need more of those stories. I hear so many stories of people saying, I got to a low point in my life and I ended up on the streets or I ended up on drugs. And in, some, in many cases, um, you know, leading to tragic circumstances. So this is a way for us to change some of the narrative, some of the things that we want to change here, crime, homelessness, fentanyl, like, one of the ways we can have a positive impact is to have a asset like New Mexico United that brings people together, no matter their situation. And uh, and so that's the dividend. Um, and you know I, we get paid in smiles every single day, and that's the greatest reward anyone could ever have. Great. Uh, thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you, Peter. Well, for me, poetry matters as a writer, as a poet. It gives me a way to notice something particular instead of, instead of the vast scope of everything that's happening because I, I can't take it in. I'm a pretty sensitive person. I care about a lot of things from the individual to the land. Uh, and so it, for me, it's a way to narrow in, focus in on something. But then poetry as a whole, as a reader or for readers is a way to build empathy and a way to build the human. That discussion between Laura and poet Lauren Camp is coming up in a little over 20 minutes. Now to that proposed calendar change from the State Public Education Department that would increase days in the classroom. The proposal comes months after the state legislature passed House Bill 130, which increased education funding in large part to accommodate an increase in required instructional hours, bumping those up to 1,140. Those hours included professional development time for teachers. The new rules under consideration would change the measuring stick to days, increasing the mandate from 176 to 180. That's on top of requiring every one of those 1,140 hours to be spent in the classroom with students. Now, this new rule isn't set in stone yet. The public has until December 18th to weigh in, and if PED adopts the change, it won't kick in until the 2024-25 school year. Earlier this week, I spoke with a current teacher at Wood Gormley Elementary School in Santa Fe to get an idea of what the change would look like in the classroom. 
Kevin Darrow has been following these policy changes and proposals closely since before the passage of House Bill 130. He tells me that simply adding more time in the classroom is an easy idea to throw at our state's education problems, but that it's not necessarily the right one. Kevin Darrow, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really my pleasure. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for covering this very important topic. Yeah, happy to. Uh, now, earlier this month, you joined dozens of teachers with Santa Fe Public Schools speaking before the legis Legislative Education Study Committee uh, against a set of rules proposed by the Public Education Department that would require districts to increase the number of instructional days from 176 to 180. Can you expand a little bit on your understanding of the proposed rule change, what else it would do, and how what it would change for students? Uh, my understanding of the rule change is it would um, it would counter effect a little bit of what happened last year with HB 130, which was um, a, a large initiative passed by the legislature to increase instructional time. It increased hours rather than days. Uh, New Mexico public schools um, were required to have 990 hours. This is elementary school where I teach. 990 hours of instructional time before HB 130 was passed. HB 130 increased that time to 1,140 instructional hours, which by the way is, if you look at all, um, if you look at the data of, of all the states across the United States, that's one of the highest numbers, 1,140 hours. Um, the HB 130 um, also called for more professional development for teachers. And that time was built into the instructional hours. My understanding is that PED is trying to um, kind of reconfigure the result of one, HB 130 and make, it, make the school year a little bit longer, not by hours, but by days. They want to count by days rather than the hours. The various districts around New Mexico were in favor of HB 130 largely because it offered flexibility. And it didn't mean that they had to change their calendars tremendously. Um, they were able to put some hours here, put some hours there, and kind of keep things, you know, the students got more time in the classroom, but it didn't really rock anybody's world in time in, in terms of calendar change. Now, what, what PED is proposing is to eliminate the counting of hours and do the counting of days basically and that will extend the calendar for students for a handful of days uh, i think it's about four or five and it will also remove the professional development time from those days and make them on top of the 180 instructional days so we're looking at adding um, quite a bit of time for for teachers and for school staff i want to go back to that hb 130 that you had mentioned before um, that was what extended the learning time, the mandate to 1,140 hours, like you said. Now, was there support among your colleagues for that change when that first happened? Oh, this is an easy question. No, there was not support for that change. HB 130 it was a very large initiative. I think it was something around like $300 million that they were going to use to cover the many aspects of HB 130, which, which covers more than just adding time, I know. Um, but it's a very large paycheck that a lot of educators did not support. When we saw this coming uh, through the pike, a lot of us, you know, were very motivated to speak, and many of us did. We tried to um, we tried to show studies that show that it's not adding time that helps students; it's adding more instructional staff that helps students. What happens when you add more time? and don't change the functioning reality of what's happening in schools is you you really just do get more of the same nothing functionally changes what we were hoping is that we could affect a change of getting more professional more trained educators hired to help students so that trained inter for for instance uh, in a third grade class let's say it's it's time for reading maybe it's it, it, there's a reading chunk for like an hour and there's 24 students in that class. All of them are going to be at very different levels. All of them are going to still need help, but different levels of help. What we were hoping is that maybe we could hire a bunch of people who could come in during this reading period and maybe two people help 
with that group and then the main teacher helps with this group or maybe like there's just three different groups happening at once and and everybody gets um very individualized help delivered on target they're focusing on the students that really need it and that's what we're hoping to spend money on helping students who really need it rather than just extending the school year for all the students who clearly some students don't need extra help but that's you know that's rolled into just extending the school year all students get it okay so you guys were not on board with lengthening the number of mandated hours um that happened and then ped comes in and says now they want to shift the mandate to days what yes. was the reaction like to that it, was it similar <laughs> is it just confusion at this point i would say it's more we are more shocked that we are trying that 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 the people in charge are trying to do more of the same change you know i understand that um legislators policymakers, that ped needs to do something to help education and i know they must be feeling a lot of pressure and from my perspective it seems as if what they always talk about is adding time and it also seems like that's the easiest thing to do i think that that's probably why that's the thing that always bubbles up first um that's why when this came up again when we already added time last year and now they want to add more time it's a different body that's trying to add more time but still as the people who are working in the schools with the students we can't believe the onslaught of more time again and not addressing what we feel are the real problems and what what studies show will help um small class sizes there's a lot of studies many many studies that show that small class sizes small cohorts um highly targeted interventions with students who are lagging helps and it doesn't just help one school year it sh these studies show that if these students receive these this intervention throughout their elementary school years then throughout their middle school and throughout their high school years they have increased performance throughout it doesn't just last for a year or two and they have higher graduation rates and they score higher on the standardized tests like act and sat it having these early interventions so many studies show that it helps but and and that's why we are frustrated that rather than focusing on these studies they just start adding more time again and you hear it from you hear it a lot i heard it from the governor's uh, office uh they said something like you know you can't argue with more time with teachers that makes more success for every student of course and and even on um on this program a couple of weeks ago dr romero said more time with teachers is obviously a good thing or something like to that effect and you hear that a lot how can you argue more time with teachers sure okay but what kind of time with teachers a time time in a classroom with 26 students where some students it's just really hard to reach them in the amount of time that you have. And we are hoping that rather than spend even more money on something that is not proven to work, that we can spend money on something that is proven to work. You can watch my entire 20 minute interview with Daryl online right now on NMPBS.org or on the New Mexico and Focus YouTube page. Now I'm joined at the table by Ellen Bernstein, president of the Albuquerque Teachers Federation, and Joy Garrett, state representative representing Bernalillo County, and also a former educator. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Yeah. Uh, now, Representative Garrett, I want to start with you. You co-sponsored House Bill 130 in January, along with Representative Andres Romero. Now, in an interview with the Santa Fe New Mexican, he called PED's proposal, quote, an affront to the legislative branch. How would PED's new idea change the bill that you helped pass? Lou, that is an important question. House Bill 130 established 11,140 1, hours of instructional time with 60 hours embedded for professional development for K-8 and then 30 hours for secondary. And this bill was reached through Ex uh, extensive collaboration, discussion, talks around the state, meetings with teachers, unions, district people, parents, as a way to extend the learning hours, but reasonably ensure that we had time for teachers to prepare. 
the proposal by PED takes away local control because now they're saying you can't do the hours the way you want to. If your district successfully has four day weeks, you can't do that anymore. You have to have 180 days of instruction. So it's a significant change. And it doesn't honor the fact that teachers help their students the most when they observe good live teaching in a classroom with a successful lesson delivered by a successful teacher. So it really completely violates the intent of House Bill 130, what it was trying to achieve, and the hours and days of work and consultation that went into bringing it to the House and the Senate and unanimously passed. Do you share Representative Romero's concerns about separation of powers and how this was pushed through? Absolutely. It's a, a violation of the separation of powers and it's a slap in the face of the legislative process of the Legislative Education Study Committee that at all of their interim meetings addressed this issue, had extensive dialogues publicly on webcasts. It really violates that separation of powers. Now, Ellen, I, I want to get to you on your perspective on House Bill 130. Um, we heard from a teacher in Santa Fe on this, uh, but what are you hearing from members in the state's largest school district on, as far as the effect of House Bill 130? Well, a couple of things. I want to say that it's not just about local control, but I think it, the rule actually changes the law. And in my opinion, I don't think rule is allowed to change the law. I think the law was very clear. and during the discussion and the debate when we were all talking about is extending the school year, increasing the number of minimum hours, the right thing to do in our state, part of that conversation was the importance of adult learning and how it impacts student learning. And what we appreciated, while it was very controversial to just add hours, because there are many other ways that we as educators uh, would like to see the state respond to our needs, but when they decided to increase the hours in addition to supporting adult learning, not only does our personal experience, but the research actually supports the idea that students do better when adults are learning. If our practice never evolves, and yet we're ex expected to do different, better, deeper learning with our students, then it's a disconnect. And what 130 did was make that connection. What we think now as teachers is, could you stop messing with us? Could you just do more supportive work that will help us do our jobs instead of constantly rearranging things and then expecting different results? What we need is still to norm out after the pandemic. We need to engage kids in deeper learning. We need to get kids to come to school because the other part of the conversation going on in the LESC is the fact that we have a lot of truancy problems. We want to get our kids in school. We want to make sure we're focusing on what they need intellectually, emotionally, socially, and we just want the PED to understand that messing with law right now is the opposite of support. Now, earlier this month, a number of teachers from Santa Fe uh, Public Schools spoke before the Legislative Education Study Committee against the increase of instructional days, specifically this PED proposal. Um, Representative Garrett, as a member of that committee, what was the overall sentiment amongst the committee members? And was there anything that stood out from you from what teachers had to say? Yeah, and I want to emphasize the House Education is a committed bipartisan group. As Representative Brian Baca says, who's an administrator? He says, we're not Democrats and Republicans, we're educators. We listened to those teachers. It was a hard lift for many of them to extend uh, to 1140 hours, but they did it as they saw us incorporate these things, like the 60 hours of embedded professional development not added on. So although they would have preferred to have more counselors, more social workers, they accepted it. The districts, our 89 districts and our 100 charter schools bent over backwards to incorporate House Bill 130 into their planning for this year. To suddenly be asked to change everything for next year is really unacceptable. 
The other thing I want to mention, because I've heard from numerous superintendents by phone call and by letter, is that using the four-day week in many of our rural areas allowed them to finally fully staff themselves. Their absenteeism wasn't such a big problem. Their attendance became better. I think it was 26 percent uh, as opposed to 40 percent chronic absenteeism. So there's a lot of healthy things that happened by allowing districts and schools to, ad to adapt that 1,140 hours to fit their local situation, their rural situation, their urban situation, their focus, everything. Okay. Now, Ellen, what existing problems, and you touched a little bit on these uh, earlier, but what existing problems might be neglected if this PE day change goes through? Well, it, it, if the PED uh, change goes through, I think what you're going to see is some really experienced, wonderful teachers just saying, that's it, I'm done. And the most important thing we could focus on right now as a state are retention techniques. We have an older workforce. We have a lot of teachers statewide who are eligible to retire. They're doing amazing work with kids in our schools, and we cannot afford to exacerbate the shortage problem by having a lot of people say, you've changed my working conditions again. You've added more to my plate again. And I think I'm not doing what I want to do with kids because of these ever-shifting mandates, and I'm done. And we just can't do that. It is very clear that experienced teachers matter in the learning of kids. And one of the reasons, you know, that people are complaining that our test scores aren't going up fast enough, but one of the reasons is because we have such big vacancy rates. If we alienate a bunch of experienced teachers or new teachers who are going to just quit and go find a new job, then we're not doing what's best for kids. So we have to keep looking at the whole picture. Now, there's a growing list of people who oppose this PED change proposal. Um, teachers, parents, state legislators, administrators. Why is there such a disconnect between these groups and the public education department in your view, Representative? My view is that House Bill 130 was vetted by all those groups over a year. Unfortunately, PED just produced this. I found out an hour before the presentation at LASC what was coming down and I'm a sponsor of the bill. I met with the governor privately and I told her in our one-on-one -on -one conversation that you have to allow time for laws to take effect. You can't change a law four months after it's gone into practice. So I think it's a huge disconnect in communication. PDED has not vetted this at all. The day that they've set for public testimony is the first day of Christmas break, Monday, December 18th. I find that incredibly disrespectful. But I also want to point out, APS educators are still working on the 18th. Mm. So I will be asking for all of their input. So when I go up to give public testimony during the hearing for the rule change, I have the thousands of teachers behind me and their voices coming in loud and clear because they will be at work that day. One thing I wanted to ask about, you know, maybe being blindsided by this a little bit um, in your view. Were they involved in the crafting of House Bill 130? Was this proposal about shifting that metric from hours to days on the table at any point before this proposal came out? It was well discussed. Um, people have different opinions. Some people believe that we need to add two weeks for teachers to study and do professional development outside of the school year. There's a lot of opinions and so the 1,140 hours represented a compromise between adding additional instruction hours and not adding so many that the school year would be ridiculously expanded. Now, the law allows for districts and charter schools to add additional days and they get additional funding for that. Again, that's a local decision that's worked out among all the stakeholders in a given district or charter school. Okay. Now, a lot of this conversation has been framed as, you know, can anyone think of more time with teachers as a bad thing? Is that how you see this equation? Is, is anyone arguing that? Or, 
Is, is that a legitimate argument, I guess, is what I'm asking? It's not a bad thing. It's just not the only thing. And, you know, we're creating as a state a, a huge investment in additional time without looking at where we need to also invest. And I think the representative was right. If you ask any teacher in the state, if you have more nurses, more counselors, more social workers who are able to work with families and kids and help regulate what they need to make sure when they're in school, they're doing well, they're able to focus, they feel safe, they feel fed. If that's our job, we need to invest in that also. We need to make sure that we really honor the fact that the pandemic, the effects of that and the way it's dysregulated families and kids and we're still trying to get back on our feet and, and make schooling the norm and make sure that, that we're able to meet those emotional needs of kids. I mean, it's still, in, it's still going on. So um, I know I had a colleague who used to say, I'm full of holes from silver bullets. And that's what this feels like. It's not just one silver bullet that changes the educational outcomes for all kids. It's a really intricately woven fabric of intentional design. And we should be working together on that. Now, I want to ask each of you this, but after all these public comments, the December 18th actually in-person com public comment session and the online has been open for a long time and it seems to be pretty well skewed as opposed. Do you think that this will pass despite all of that? Well, it's not a bill that passes. It's a rule change by PED making a mandate. How they're going to respond to the public outcry, I don't know. We'll have to see. But what I'm hearing is people do not want this change across the board, whether they're families, educators, it doesn't matter. They're very displeased about it. And I don't think we can afford in the educational community another break in trust. And I think if the educational community is saying, and probably uh, a fair number of the parent community saying, don't mess with this. We just started this. Let us get our heads and our practices around the change. Let's see what happens over some time. And if they don't listen to that and they impose the rule anyway, that's going to be a huge break in trust. It's going to cause a lot of turmoil. And that's the opposite of what schools would benefit from. Understood. Ellen Bernstein, Representative Joy Garrett, thank you so much for talking to me about this. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The Public Education Department is still accepting input from the community on the proposed change. You can comment through Monday, December 18th, with a public hearing scheduled for that afternoon in Santa Fe. We have more information under this story on our website. Now moving on, New Mexico Poet Laureate Lauren Camp was in the studio this week to talk about her new book and a project of hers that builds poetry across New Mexico's communities. In conversation with Our Land's Laura Paskus, Camp also talks about poetry in a world in crisis and how poetry can teach us to be patient and to slow down in a world that's moving faster all the time. Lauren Camp, New Mexico Poet Laureate, welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. It is always so sweet to have a poet in the studio, so thanks for being here. So you have a new book out, Worn Smooth Between Devourings. What characterizes this collection from maybe your past books? I think of this book as very much a love letter to New Mexico, which isn't really different from my other books because I'm very much in love with New Mexico. But this has poems both about like the wonder, the awe, of New Mexico and witnessing. So there's a lot of environmental um, attention here, a lot of attention to the biosphere, um, to the fires, to the intense heat, intensifying heat and the drought. Um, so it's a combination of things. Yeah. So um, one of your poems is called, I'm Always Now Studying the Urgency. And I'd really like to talk about that poem specifically and, you know, what you're witnessing and expressing through the words in that poem. The, um, so it's the long poem that, that basically anchors the collection. It comes about two-thirds of the way through. 
and it was my way of I guess of having some kind of agency or some kind of uh, action as I was watching all the fires that were consistently year after year and growing um, coming across New Mexico. And so shaping that poem, writing the poem with its uh, repetitions and its uh, uh, increasing sonics and everything gave me a chance both to shape it, to play in the language of it, and to acknowledge the grief of it. Yeah, so like you mentioned, it, it is a long poem, um, but I was hoping you would read a bit um, on page 49. Sure. Um, starting with, we moved here to a land wrought to hurts, and starting there and reading that that stanza. Absolutely. We moved here to a land wrought to hurts. Inside the warped forest, I took one picture of worship, one picture of the brink, one picture to picture it untucked in long spasm, shiny vehemence. This wasn't a pilgrimage, but a way to remember conductive pulses, red scars, and recurrence. Thank you. I think um, anyone in New Mexico can just really resonate with those those words, the scars, the recurrence, the fires over and over again. So thank you for reading that bit. Um, I also wanted to just talk briefly about this new publication out. Can you talk a bit about this, um, where it comes out of, what it's a part of, where people can get it? Sure. Um, it's a coloring book and activity kit. It's coming out of the New Mexico State Library and New Mexico Arts, which are the two organizations that uh, handle the New Mexico Poet Laureate position. Uh, I worked over the past 14 or 15 months with uh, Department of Cultural Affairs educators from around the state to build this book. They asked for a handful of poems from me. So there are five poems in the book and they built, the book is called Imagine Nature and they built it around those poems. I wrote prompts as well. And it is intended for the youth of New Mexico around the state. It's to increase literacy and engagement, uh, creativity. It's for the kids and their parents or caregivers. And it should be, I, I've been told I will find it everywhere around the state. So I would guess you would too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you are New Mexico's Poet Laureate and also an Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellow. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, and as part of that, you were awarded $50,000. Can you talk about the program that you have set up and are working on? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's the fellowship from the Academy of American Poets is for a project I proposed, which is for me to travel around the state in conjunction with New Mexico Arts, uh, holding, hosting and holding epic poem workshops among other things. So likely doing a reading and a conversation around poetry, but then sort of gradually moving people toward being able to contribute to a poem, not write a poem necessarily, because a lot of times the audience I'm, I'm either dealing with or want to be dealing with is people who don't necessarily know what a poem is or know that a poem could be something that they could write or um, that they could engage with. And so I want to sort of comfortably and gradually bring them into the world of poetry in a very safe way. But the epic poem workshops are fabulous. I mean, they're, they're so much fun. Uh, I've done probably six or so, six or eight so far in various rural and underserved places around the state so far. Uh, and they are designed to get community members to contribute communally to a poem about their area. And so then the words of the poem will be from them. I will build them into a poem and the historic palace press will make them into gorgeous letterpress broadsides that will then be gifted back. One will be gifted back to each community and probably will build an exhibit or two 
um, that can travel around the state. So it's an, it's an incredible and exciting project that involves a lot of collaboration from a lot of places. Awesome. And how long is that? Like, when does that go through? It's a year. Okay. And um, the, the Academy Fellowship is a year. The project itself will probably take longer, but I will get through at least a third of the workshops in that year. I yeah. love it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the world is an overwhelming place. Um, whether you're watching fires, whether you're worried about being bombed, finding your next meal, um, worried about climate change and rising sea levels, like even if you're not address, even if you're not experiencing an emergency, the world still feels really overwhelming. And I would love to know from your perspective, like why and how poetry matters in this world that feels constantly in crisis? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Um, po well, for me, poetry matters. As a writer, as a poet, it gives me a way to notice something particular instead of, instead of the vast scope of everything that's happening because I, I can't take it in. I'm a pretty sensitive person. I care about a lot of things from the individual to the land. Uh, and so it, for me, it's a way to narrow in, focus in on something. But then poetry as a whole, as a reader or for readers, is a way to build empathy and a way to build the human. And so I think I go looking for poems that hold some of the emotion I'm feeling or perhaps something that I need to be feeling even. You know, if I'm feeling an overwhelm from the, the grief of the world or the dangers of the world, I might go toward poems that are about gratitude or about, I don't know, about joy even. So I think it's, I think either way from the writing perspective or the reader perspective, it's a chance to bring it back to the personal, the individual and some kind of intimate, um, I don't know, like kindness almost. Yeah, I like that. Um, do we all have like our poets we admire and poets we like to read over and over again? But, but for anyone, you know, whether they consider themselves a poet or not, how does the act of creating a poem or sharing a poem you love um, change someone's perspective or change the world? For me, the, one of the things that poetry taught me, and I'm not sure this answers your question, but I feel like it's so relevant. One of the things poetry taught me was patience um, and um, a sort of generosity to myself, I think. Not that I was not, not that I was particularly hard on myself. I mean, I began creating things, um, art, little art projects and writing things when I was a little girl and nobody paid any attention to them. So I wasn't, I wasn't particularly challenged on whether what I did was good enough. But poetry, I, I think poetry more than almost anything else I've done takes a kind of time, a kind of marinating time, of slowing down time. Some of the process of creating it is waiting. Some of the process of creating it is looking. Some of the process of creating it is doing nothing, you know, nothing related to it. So for me, that's a, that's a huge benefit of it. I mean, I don't think we have a culture that is slow ever anymore. And I keep holding this space open for poetry for myself and trying to do it for anyone else. I think poems take two readings at a minimum so that you, you know, you maybe, you maybe read through it and you get one thing on first coming up to it and then on, on second reading you get something else or you get something more. Um, if you read it five months from now you get something perhaps totally different that you need. Mm -hmm. Well, Lauren Camp, thank you so much for being here and for holding space. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Laura and Lauren for that conversation. Finally tonight, 
New Mexico's recently redrawn congressional map will stand. That's after the state Supreme Court upheld a lower court's ruling approving the Democratic-drawn district lines. Republicans sued over the redistricting process, specifically how it changed CD2, a conservative oil-producing area in a swing district along the U.S.-Mexico border. The Supreme Court's ruling echoes the decision from District Court Judge Fred Van Solen. He found that there wasn't, quote, egregious gerrymandering, unquote. Republicans argued that the new map will solidify Democratic power in the district for years to come. But the justices say that it's still competitive, citing Democratic challenger Gabe Vasquez's narrow win over Republican incumbent Yvette Harrell in 2022. The state's Republicans are contemplating their next steps after the Supreme Court's ruling. Democrats hold all statewide elected offices in New Mexico, and they'll hope to keep that clean sweep going next November when Vasquez and Harrell will likely face off again. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.